was like, I, like, I just live my life unconsciously. Like, I, everything I do is, I do unconsciously, and it's out of my control. I wish I could control it, but unfortunately, I. She was solely at the mercy of her imaginary rat friends. The make-believe rodents would tell her to kill her brother or jump off windows to hurt herself. Janie Schofield was only six years old when she was diagnosed with a severe case of schizophrenia, making her a unique case of a child born with a mental health disease. And her shocking story would end in a horrifying twist. Join us as we navigate the worst case of schizophrenia that exists. What happened to Janie Schofield? Janie Schofield's troubling early life. When January Schofield was born in 2002, her parents were convinced that they had been blessed with a gifted child. While the small child was erratic and restless, she possessed the ultimate prowess over numbers and letters. It was uncommon for a child of her age to recognize number patterns quickly and make sense of the symbols surrounding them. But by all means, January, who would end up shortening her name to Janny, was almost a prodigy. Before she could even walk, she was trying to read books that one would probably read in high school. While her parents gave her children's books and read to her quite often, Janny was always restless to learn more. She would quickly grow tired of her baby books. And well, it made sense. A child of her caliber couldn't do much with simplistic sentences, drawn storylines, and illustrations for kids. But as Janny grew older, her curiosity and eagerness to learn were quickly replaced by extreme agitation and erratic behavior. By the age of two, she would create chaos at home and everywhere her parents took her. For Michael, and Susan Schofield, their child was probably acting out, or perhaps she felt lonely. They tried their best to take her to places where she would be able to interact with kids her age. Yet the idea quickly turned into a nightmare. When things didn't go Janie's way, her toys would quickly turn into weapons. She would take a second to hurl crayons and stuffed toys at kids she was playing with, or even her parents, who tried to stop their child from embarrassing them in public. But of course, January was just a child. Sure, she was uncooperative and threw the worst tantrums. Yet for her parents, she was an intelligent kid who was just finding it difficult to adjust to the world. Everyone around them considered Janny an ill-behaved child, the result of bad parenting, who was grossly entitled and privileged. It's true that Janny probably had the world in the palm of her hands. After all, she was the only child of her parents who were going above and beyond to ensure that their daughter felt comfortable in their home and beyond. But Michael and Susan felt helpless too. They knew that Janie's intelligence meant that she was more self-aware than other children of her age. But she would cry and throw tantrums at the smallest of things, from feeling weird about her shoes to eating sugary foods for dinner. Every issue seemed childlike. Yet, nothing about Janie's reactions was childish. Most children quiet down after their bodies lose energy at the end of an intense crying session. But for January, tantrums and meltdowns hardly ever subsided. The other problem was she was so relentlessly energetic and hyperactive. Since both Michael and Susan had jobs and divided their time to take care of Janny, they required a good night's rest to function the next day. But with Janny, getting some shut eye was next to impossible. You see, unlike kids her age who go into deep slumber very quickly, Janny's energy was always inexhaustible. For hours and hours, she would stay awake playing with her toys or just amusing herself with her non-existent pet animals. Yep, Janny preferred to spend time with her imaginary friends and pets rather than going outside and mingling with other kids. She would bring her toys out with her imaginary pets and without missing a beat, she would play with them. At times, she would do things that were strictly instructed by her parents. While the Schofields kept pets at home, Janny was more inclined to have a dinner party with her cats that would talk to her solely. For the most part, Janny was being a kid. Her parents didn't pay heed to her ramblings because once again, their daughter was a child doing childlike things. But as January grew up, the problem became more and more persistent. Michael and Susan began to suspect that perhaps their daughter wasn't telling creative and imaginative tales about a cat named Midnight because she got inspired by cartoons or TV shows. They had assumed that she would draw her imaginary pets because, well, she loved crafts and playing with her crayons. But in reality, Janny was going through a mental turmoil of her own. She wasn't imagining those cats and rats, in fact. She perceived them to be very real. 
real enough to consider them as her actual friends who existed outside of her imagination. No wonder she got confused when her parents couldn't see her friends who dictated her life pretty much every day. From what socks to wear to when to act out, Janny was getting instructions from her very real pets, who possessed the capacity to understand her thoughts and speak her thoughts. What happened after Janie's fourth birthday? Before Janie could celebrate her fourth birthday, the situation had hit the fan. She would cry nonstop, and in an interview, Susan revealed that her daughter only slept in 20-minute stretches. Despite their busy schedule, the Schofields took her to Ikea and the Los Angeles Zoo almost every alternative day to keep her engaged and busy. They could sense that when Janie wasn't occupied with an activity that she liked, her thoughts would get more and more intrusive. The biggest problem was her imaginary world building, which grew drastically by Janie's third birthday. In the same interview, Susan revealed that January would always tell her about her pet animals who self-identified with names. For instance, Janie was friends with Lo the dog and an orange tabby cat named 400. It was the same to say that the troubled but genius child was always in a world of her own. According to her old interviews, we could see that with each passing year, her imaginary friends grew in number. At a certain point in time, she began to befriend rats, too. Janie believed her imaginary pet friends lived on a fictional island off the coast of California that she named Kalalini. The child was only three years old when she came up with that creative name for her pet residence. While her tendencies were concerning, Michael and Susan got their sense of comfort, knowing that their daughter was a genius. At the age of four, Janie was smoothly doing arithmetic operations, including complex multiplication and division. Curious, Michael and Susan decided to test their daughter's IQ, and they were shocked to the core. The troubled child who got glares everywhere she went had a stellar IQ score of 146, which effectively put her into the genius or near-genius category. Even Janie's therapist couldn't believe what they were seeing. They decided to assess their patient further, and the results were fascinating. It turned out that January had a mental age between 10 and 11 years old. Such results further added to what Michael and Susan had believed originally, their child just found it hard to fit into the world. While she was more suited to engage with adults, her young age meant she had to interact with people her age who possessed a very low caliber of intelligence. But of course, the tantrums didn't end, and Janie's refuge was her animals, who didn't exist. While the Schofields played along with her, they knew something had to be done about their daughter's extremely antisocial behavior too. And this is when things started to go downhill. After Janie's fourth birthday, something very transformative happened in the Schofield household. Michael and Susan had welcomed their second child, named Bodhi. According to a publication by the New York Post, they had named their son after the tree that shaded Buddha when he reached enlightenment. It's clear that her parents were hoping that with the arrival of a baby boy, Janie would calm down and would find a way to love her brother. After all, they had seen the most erratic of children finding a certain sense of responsibility and tranquility to appease their young siblings. Plus, a name based on a peaceful and spiritual figure could have had a comforting effect on their daughter too. But oh boy, Schofields couldn't have possibly imagined everything that came after Bodhi's birth. A mere glimpse of the young baby boy would drive Janie to the verge of extreme violence, where she would make elaborate attempts at trying to kill her own brother. Michael and Susan were left hurt and shocked. A series of misdiagnosis. For the past four years, they had forced themselves to believe that there was nothing wrong with Janie, and she just felt misunderstood. But the way she projected murderous rage toward her own flesh and blood freaked them out. Talking about the situation, Michael revealed that whenever Janie heard any sound from Bodhi, including his cries, she would attempt to silence him using violent measures, including ending his life once and for all. The situation escalated when a four-year-old January started to hit her parents too. It was December 27, 2007, three days after Bodhi's birth, when Janny threw a remote control at the baby because he wouldn't stop crying. Prior to this violent outburst, her parents had explained to her that babies cry. It's typical for them, and when she was young as Bodhi, she would cry pretty much all the time. Janny didn't take kindly to this parental talk. When the remote missed Bodhi's face, she lunged toward her mother, who was trying to protect Bodhi from her violent tendencies. The troubled daughter began to kick Susan in her stomach and narrowly missed Bodhi while launching herself onto her mother. Michael was quick to hold Janie down, 
He quickly grabbed her arms and pinned her down to allow her to calm down. But nope, the act of resistance only seemed to rile up Janny even more. Her uncontrollable rage had given her inexhaustible energy, too much that even a grown man wasn't able to hold her down. She began to punch Michael in his lungs and head, shockingly knocking the air out of him. Recalling the incident, Michael remarked that his small, petite daughter had possessed some superhuman fury at that time. Janny had even scratched her dad's face and bitten his chin while he attempted to save his son from her. During the episode, Janny kept shouting that she had to hurt Bodhi, otherwise she wouldn't be able to control herself. It's safe to say that Michael and Susan were left terrified by their own daughter. So much so that one of the parents had to lock themselves with Bodhi. Later, the Schofields tried to have a conversation with Janny, trying to inquire what had led her to hit Bodhi with such sheer force and anger. What they heard was deeply unsettling and terrifying. Janny had confessed that she herself didn't want to hurt Bodhi, but her imaginary rat friends didn't like her brother at all, and they had ordered her to attack the small child using hefty objects like the remote. The parents didn't know what to make of the situation. While it looked like a typical case of sibling jealousy, Janny constantly pinned down the blame on her imaginary pets who were forcing her to act out. Her violent episodes hardly subsided. The situation escalated a number of times. Feeling defeated, Michael had to take an off from his job as a lecturer at California State University to hold down their daughter while Susan tended to Bodie. The issue that the Schofields couldn't hold down their jobs meant that money was tight in the household. Eventually, Susan got laid off from work too. Her unemployment and Michael's shaky presence at his workplace drove the family into a financial crisis, which was about to be exacerbated once they got to know Janny's daunting diagnosis. At the same time, their routine got tough too. Both of them woke up at the crack of dawn, took showers, and whisked Bodhi out, all of it before Janny could wake up and begin to attack her baby brother. Feeling helpless, the parents took Janny to multiple doctors who couldn't truly come up with a diagnosis. While the child displayed severe signs of mental health illnesses, she was too young to suffer from them. Eventually, a doctor diagnosed Janny with ADHD, and she was prescribed Ritalin, and you can probably guess what happens next. Ritalin had caused an exponential boost in Janny's energy levels, and she began to attack Bodhi with even more rigor. Michael and Susan didn't know what to do next. Believe it or not, it was Janny who would come to their rescue. One day, Janny told her dad that she needed to be in a hospital and not in her home with Bodhi. When Michael inquired about her reasons for living in a hospital, she replied, I want to hit Bodhi all the time. I can't help it. Her parents knew it was time to act. In March 2008, Janie was taken to a psychiatric hospital in Alhambra, California. Doctors tried their best to diagnose her, but even after a three-week stay, they didn't get a concrete answer. Unfortunately, she was discharged and was brought back home. But of course, she was still struggling and began to attack Bodhi once again. Then she was taken to a second psychiatric hospital in Redlands, which proved to be a terrible idea for Michael and Susan. At the hospital, the parents got a scolding for doing their job terribly, and the nurses alleged that they couldn't accept that they were bad at parenting and that their daughter had gone rogue. On top of the very disheartening comments, a doctor misdiagnosed Janny with a case of severe anxiety. The doctor told the Schofields that they needed to manage their daughter better and sent them home. After that, Janie's situation continued to deteriorate. After each violent episode, she was forced to take psychiatric care, which was pretty hefty for the parents. In a span of a short time, Janie had tried to unalive her brother multiple times. She kept hitting her pet dog, Honey. And one day, she tried to take her own life too. While in the hospital, she kept telling her parents that she wanted to jump out of the hospital window and if that wouldn't happen, she threatened to part her head from her body. Her issues grew in her school, too. As a first grader, she had to do a lot of group activities, which didn't turn out so well. Janny was growing up to be very antisocial, and whenever a child was nice to her, she would either hit them or would straight up ignore them. Michael and Susan got multiple complaints of their daughter being disruptive and ill-behaved. By then, Janny was completely being controlled by her imaginary friends and pets who had grown in number, her mind was occupied by two little girls named 100 Degrees and 24 Hours, 200 The Rat, Magical 61 The Cat, and 400. The parents realized that Janny had no control over her imaginary friends, and in fact, they were the ones who controlled her. 
In particular, 400, the cat would prompt Janny to hit people at school. Eventually, her doctor, Glendale Woodall, gave her a new prescription of Haldol, one milligram per day. The meds seemed to work, and eventually, 400, the cat went away. Susan was keen to send her daughter back to school, after giving her a break because of her violent activities. And then the unspeakable happened. The problem reveals itself. In January 2009, the Schofields sent their daughter to first grade once again, but the day had barely begun for the child when the muscle on the left side of her body locked up, leading her to collapse in her classroom. The school immediately called the paramedics. It had turned out that Janny had developed dystonia, the involuntary contractions of muscles, which is a common side effect of taking high doses of psychotropic meds. The parents lowered her dose of Haldol and other medicines to prepare her for school. Four days later, she was sent to first grade once again with a new glimmer of hope, but the worst was yet to come. By 9 a.m., Janny began to scream, demanding to meet her brother, Bodhi. When her teachers tried to calm her down, she threw pencils and shoes at them and then ran toward the classroom window, presumably to escape. Then she made a run for the school halls, where the assistant principal tried to control her. And when the situation got out of hand, Michael was called to intervene. Tired of the situation, Michael refused to take his daughter home. Feeling drained, the dad didn't know what to do next, but the school was growing restless, and eventually, the assistant principal called the cops on Michael, citing child abandonment and neglect. Citing the incident, Janie's dad said, I knew if we took her home, we couldn't get any help anywhere. We were fed up with nobody believing us, nobody helping us. While talking to the police, Michael admitted that his daughter needed help that he was unable to provide. The school psychologists also agreed that Janie needed special help. So in that case, a sheriff's deputy had called for a team of emergency psychiatric workers. For the next 24 hours, Janie was locked into an empty office while psychological experts assessed her behavior. It was concluded that she was psychotic and was unfit to stay in a communal environment like a home or her school. She was sent to UCLA Medical Hospital, where doctors observed her for a month. Only then did they offer a diagnosis that left everyone shocked. For the past few erratic years, Janny had been suffering from a rare case of childhood onset schizophrenia. The child's principal doctor, Anthony D'Antonia, didn't want to buy into his assessment either. After all, in his long professional career of 25 years, he had never seen someone as unique as Janny. Even his peers cited skepticism at his diagnosis because schizophrenia was known to develop in people in their early 20s. For a child to experience something similar was simply unheard of. Speaking about the odd case, Dr. D'Antonia said, If you met her when I first met her, there was no mistaking what she had. She presented with elaborate auditory and visual hallucinations that could not be described in any other way. Janie's parents were torn. They knew that they couldn't take their daughter home because she was still a threat to Bodhi and she was too young to be institutionalized. That's when Susan and Michael decided that they'd rent another apartment where one of them could stay with Janny. The option seemed the only way to go about the issue, but of course, it was pretty heavy on their wallets. Janny's medical bills were piling up too, and Bodhi had his own needs. In an article published by the Huffington Post, it was revealed that Janie's apartment was outfitted to resemble the psychiatric ward. Like the hospital, they had a blackboard and penciled in who was on duty, mommy or daddy, and outlined the events for the day. All sharp objects or cookware stayed in Bodhi's apartment. That sort of setting was not very ideal for a child who was pretty imaginative in her play. Even though the two apartments were nearby, Susan and Michael barely had time to meet. They wouldn't sleep in the same beds. It wasn't shocking that their marriage would soon end. Michael had admitted to almost cheating on Susan with his co-workers, and when his wife found out, she almost divorced him. The situation had become so dire that Michael swallowed a bunch of Lexapro because he didn't want to live anymore. It was a miracle that his life was saved by the doctors. It was later revealed that Janny was being particularly difficult while her dad was trying to take care of her. Feeling hopeless, Michael had taken the hard step. However, it was Michael who would take the first brave step to end the two apartment deal. He knew that if he had to save his marriage and support Susan, they would need to live under the same roof. After a year and a half of living separately, the family reunited. At the age of nine, Janny was taking a combination of clozapine, lithium, and thorazine to control her psychosis. This is when the family situation got a bit better. Even though Janny still had to visit UCLA a number of times, she was feeling relatively better. 
talking about their routine hospital visits, Michael said, Basically, because she is in constant conflict between our world and her world every waking moment, eventually that wears her down. In a sense, UCLA is kind of like a break from our world. Around the same time, Janny started special education classes too, and adopted some healthy habits like feeding the cats in an animal shelter and taking therapy. Back then, the pressing concern was her hallucinations, which had lessened but were still interrupting her life. Michael was able to convince her that rats only live for five years, and whoever it was who was urging her to jump off the windows and hit her brother was not real. For Janny, that sort of logic made sense, and she began to control her interactions with imaginary rats. By the looks of it, things seemed to settle down for Michael and Susan, who would eventually divorce in 2015. But wait for a major twist in the story, the aftermath. Believe it or not, there's a major theory on the internet that Janny never had schizophrenia despite having a solid diagnosis. The internet reached this conclusion after observing Susan's behavior online. You see, when Bodhi was four years old, he was diagnosed with mild to moderate autism. Multiple experts, including Dr. Phil, made the same diagnosis. But Susan, who had separated from Michael, was convinced that her son had schizophrenia too. In fact, the internet had figured out that the mother had gone doctor shopping a practice that entails a parent seeking a diagnosis for their children's illnesses that aligns with their imagination. In Bodhi's case, it was a dangerous case of schizophrenia. Not to mention, Susan had built an internet brand out of her children's misery. The family had gotten a lot of mainstream recognition after appearing on high-profile shows like Oprah and Dr. Phil. While Michael capitalized on the situation by writing a book on Janny, Susan began her vlogging venture on YouTube. By the age of 11, Bodhi was taking an intense regimen of medicines like Thorazine, Clozapine, Geodon, Depakote, Vivons, Lithium, Seroquel, Zeprexa, Risperdal, and Lyrica. The internet saw Susan going to the doctors who would give Bodhi intense medicines that would further slur his words and put him into a catatonic state. Concerned by Susan's behavior, her viewers began to mass report her to the authorities compilations of her mistreating Bodhi started to make rounds on the internet. Eventually, Bodhi was taken away from Susan and was put into foster care while Janny stayed with her mom. The predicament with the boy made people wonder if Susan had falsified her daughter's diagnosis too, in order to keep up with her fantasies. By the looks of it, it is probable that Janny and Bodhi were victims of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, a disorder where parents or caretakers feign illness and disease in their children. Perhaps Susan's condition was propelled by her bipolar disorder, and Michael only enabled her problematic treatment of their children. There's no way for us to know the truth. Today, the Schofield family has retired from the internet, and an almost 24-year-old Janny isn't interested in living a public life. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.